that. Um, let's get started. It's my pleasure to, this morning to, enjoy, to introduce uh, Professor Paul Egilstone. Um, you will have seen him in some of the other sessions that we've had throughout the last couple of days, and we appreciate his enthusiasm and involvement over the last few days as well. Um, he's the head of School of Creative Industries at the University of Newcastle. Um, and I'm excited to hear his talk today. Uh, what I'm gonna do is put his bio in the chat um, so that if there are any other comments and questions following we can uh, you can write them there as well. But with that, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Paul. That's great. Thanks, Tamsin. Thanks and welcome uh, everybody. Thanks for your um, time this morning. Um, uh, yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, spending the next um, little bit of time with you. I, I have to apologize in advance that I need to duck out inevitably 10 minutes early because I'm hiring for some new positions, which is always a really nice thing to be doing. Uh, this was the only slot I couldn't actually move. I managed to work around everybody else's uh, apart from my own. Um, so forgive me, but of course, if there are questions that um, I don't get time to answer uh, today, I'll be back on um, in the chat. I'll make sure that I follow those up uh, with you um, individually. Um, so uh, in preparing for these kind of talks, you know, I, I was looking at um, uh, the programme coming together uh, and trying to work through um, how, how could it do something uh, that hopefully would be kind of uh, uh, obviously in line with the theme uh, of the conference uh, and would be um, uh, meaningful, uh, hopefully, to all of those people who wanted to hear this, uh, this talk uh, and, and yet a little bit um, provocative perhaps um, as well, because we are obviously here to encourage uh, discourse and debate and, uh, and I certainly don't plan to have um, any of the, uh, all of the answers. I've got some ideas like everybody else and I'm happy to share those uh, ideas with you. Uh, but there were a few things without singling out any of the individual kind of presentations or the great work that people have been doing as part of the conference. Uh, there are some really strong themes that of course do emerge uh, under those subheadings. Um, there seems to be of course a genuine commitment to uh, working out how we can um, uh, live and work uh, far more sustainably. Uh, and, and in a more kind of environmentally friendly manner. Um, there's uh, certainly lots of uh, uh, concerns about and, and, and conversations about um, teaching and pedagogy, as you'd expect. Uh, there are panels that, that, that focus on uh, research, design research, and use uh, some of those kind of ac academic terminologies that those of us who are in this field and in this area kind of understand uh, only too well. Uh, and looking across the piece, um, I was sort of moved to try and um, develop something for you that I hope will be, um, you know, whet your appetites a, a little bit. Um, I, I've used it as a bit of an opportunity, I have to say, to um, uh, not to promote particularly, but to um, present uh, the Future Art, Science and Technology Laboratory. Um, uh, it's uh, the, uh, a lab that um, I set up and Mario Maniakello is uh, co-director of. Uh, but it goes through um, hopefully some of the work that, that, that we've been doing and links it uh, across to many of the themes um, of the conference. So um, uh, I actually wasn't sure whether at one moment, uh, because of the interview panels, whether I was going to be able to make this talk or not. Um, so I actually did record a little bit of video. So I am, it's 20 minutes, so I am going to um, play the video, uh, but I'll be um, online um, here watching with you uh, and happy to take um, you know, comments, critiques, uh, questions uh, uh, during the video or, or once the video is finished. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen. We've just experimented with this and it seemed to be okay. Hopefully you can see that. What's stopping us? And hear it. Hello and welcome, whether you're listening live in cyberspace or you've time shifted and are hearing this as a recording. Uh, I'm Professor Paul Egglestone, uh, co-director of FastLab. I'm grateful for your company on this show. Sorry, Paul, it seems you have stopped. Oh, let's go back. Let's try that again. Short journey. I hope we make really good use of our time together. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I'm speaking from here in Newcastle, New South Wales, the Awabakal people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We 
are designers, developers, creative technologists and multidisciplinary communicators. We are troubled by the present state of our industry and its effects on cultures and societies across the world. We have become part of a professional climate that prizes venture capital, profit and scale over usefulness and resonance, demands a debilitating work-life imbalance of its workers, lacks critical diversity in gender, race and age, claims to solve problems but favours those of a superficial nature, treats consumers' personal information as objects to be monetized instead of personal property to be supported and protected, and refuses to address the need to reform policies affecting the jurisdiction and ownership of data. Encouraged in these directions, we have applied ourselves toward the creation of trivial, undifferentiated apps, disposable social networks, fantastical gadgets obtainable only by the affluent, products that use emotion as a front for the sale of customer data, products that reinforce broken or dishonest forms of commerce and insular communities that drive away potential collaborators and well-grounded leaders. Some of us have lent our expertise to initiatives that abuse the law and human rights, defeat critical systems of encryption and privacy and put lives at risk. We have negated our profession's potential for positive impact and are using up our time and energy manufacturing demands for things that are redundant at best, destructive at worst. There are pursuits more worthy of our dedication. Our abilities can benefit areas such as education, medicine, privacy and digital security, public awareness and social campaigns, journalism, information design and humanitarian aid. They can transform our current systems of finance and commerce and reinforce human rights and civil liberties. It is also our responsibilities as members of our industry to create positive changes within it. We must work to improve our stance on diversity, inclusion, working conditions and employees' mental health. Failing to address these issues should no longer be deemed acceptable by any party. Ultimately, regardless of its area of focus or scale, our work and mindset must take on a more ethical, critical ethos. It is not our desire to take the fun out of life. There should always be room for entertainment, personal projects, humour, experimentation and light-hearted use of our abilities. Instead, we're calling for a refocusing of priorities in favour of more lasting democratic forms of communication, a mind shift away from profit over people business models and the placing of corporations before individuals toward the exploration and production of the humble, meaningful work and beneficial cultural impact. I'm sure many of you listening to this talk will know that none of these are my original thoughts or my original words. You'll recognise them as an adaptation and recontextualisation of Ken Garland's First Things First Manifesto, published in Britain in 1964. But in preparing for this talk, I looked again at the original, rereading those profound truths that the late Ken Garland and the 20 or so manifesto signatories surfaced over 60 years ago. Then I asked myself a few questions intended to assess how much we changed over half a century. There are four questions. One. Have we busied ourselves committing to those pursuits deemed more worthy of our time and talent? Have we taken the opportunity to create positive change? Are our critical faculties and ethical mindsets seamlessly interwoven with our work? And just as importantly, number four, are we remembering to have fun along the way? What follows is in no way intended as self-aggrandizement, rather it's a reflection on the seemingly semi-conscious application of Garland's manifesto on recent practice through the lens of a series of interactions and projects developed and delivered by FastLab, the Future Art, Science and Technology Laboratory here at the University of Newcastle. Obviously the selected examples are subjective, but I offer them as prompts for discussion starters to be measured against Garland's manifesto. To help us do that, here's a bit about FastLab so you've some idea of what it is as an entity. FastLab comprises staff, academic and technical, and students, HDRs and PhDs drawn from the University of Newcastle, working alongside SMEs, freelancers and NGOs in transdisciplinary teams on research projects and programmes using creative practice methods 
and processes. We've been busy building a vibrant culture of learning by doing and creating several pathways for organisations, researchers and creatives to engage with us and each other. You can find out more about how we do all of this at other conference sessions led by some of our researchers. Working with external research partners using our own blended learning model, we've developed a low cost series of concentrated learning events that enable students and researchers to see the positive impact they're making through research and development. Our approach ensures that they're part of a process of change as well as developing their learning and experience. Our research focuses on human-centred interactions. It harnesses human imagination, empathy, cooperation, co-design, design thinking, visualisation, playfulness and creativity. It enables a better understanding of the underlying systems of creativity and the motivations of humans provides new opportunities to respond to some of our most important challenges. We have a set of research themes. Most relevant to this talk is that of human behaviour, a theme led by Fast Labs co-director, Professor Mario Minichiello. First things first, has Fast Lab busied itself committing to those pursuits deemed more worthy of its time and talent? I was recently asked to submit an op-ed piece for the Global Alliance of Media Innovations Media Lab's annual report. In line with Gallen's manifesto, the bit where he writes about applying what ability we might have to some higher calling, I penned an opening paragraph that read, if we are to attain sustainable economic growth alongside balanced social and environmental development, we need to radically rethink how businesses, government and NGOs can create value through creativity and innovation. Creativity that's rooted in sustainable, social, economic, environmental and cultural practices. So far, so good. The following morning, uh, I woke to an email from Associate Professor John Mills in the UK. He was editing the report. It read, Paul, and we've long since dropped the airs and graces afforded by any titular recognition. There's just no respect. I wonder if there's scope for a translational paragraph here that you could position how the news media in Australia and beyond could benefit from this type of thinking and approach. Touché. My response prompted a much deeper dive into a previous life, that as a documentary filmmaker who'd subsequently spent a fair amount of time working with journalists and media professionals attempting to respond to the decimation of journalism's business models in the early days of the internet. This is where I landed. See what you think. If we are to attain sustainable economic growth alongside balanced social and environmental development, we need to radically rethink how businesses, government and NGOs can create value through creativity and innovation. Creativity that is rooted in sustainable social, economic, environmental and cultural practices. This is potentially furtive ground for news media organisations, traditionally charged with holding those in power to account and providing us with the information we need to make informed decisions. We know that human impact on climate change is not a matter of opinion, it's a fact. We know time is against us and that we must act now to fundamentally transform society. The evidence tells us that in 10 years we'll be too late. We know most world leaders have made commitments to sustainability and that a sustainable society, ecologically, socially and economically, requires a journalism that addresses this. It provides an opportunity for journalism that recognises its own existential crisis cannot be separated from the need to create a sustainable society, ecologically, economically and socially. It calls for a journalism that understands and accepts that its social licence that implicit basic permission science uh, society gives to any corporate organisation to conduct its activities will be increasingly threatened if it fails to adequately, ad adequately address the sustainability challenges facing humanity. This is difficult terrain for traditional journalism, rooted as it is in news values of proximity, immediacy, negativity and sensationalism. But FastLab is committed to working with media companies to expand their role and in doing so, their potential relevance in society by helping news organisations reimagine how they might actively contribute to the same sustainable transformation of society. 
First things first, have we taken the opportunity to create positive change? By drawing on and combining the innovation processes and tools we have at our fingertips, we can make ideas tangible and build the collective agency to bring them to life. That's the bit that makes us human. To paraphrase Herbert Simon, design is the act of deliberately moving an existing situation to a preferred one. It takes human imagination to envision what that preferred situation might look like. In some cases, that's an easy call. We know that there are enough technological and financial resources in the world to provide the seven and a half billion people on Earth with a good life. Everyone could be living in a clean and safe environment, get a quality education, a secure income and access to healthcare. Reducing food waste, changing diets and increasing crop yields could provide enough food for the entire planet's population. There's nothing more essential to support life on Earth than water and our ability to access water for drinking, cooking, cleaning and growing food. And yet, according to Water Aid, over 770 million people don't have clean water close to home. Now, this has recently been brought home to us here in Australia, where we've seen the dire impacts of drought on our remote and regional communities. Our response at FastLab has been to team up with a local engineering company who've got a brief to design and build a standalone containerized water filtration plant suitable for remote communities in the Northern Territories. I'm delighted to be able to tell you that they've delivered the brief and developed an inexpensive viable offering. Mission accomplished. We've moved to that preferred state, except we haven't. The reason people are deprived of the fundamental conditions of life like food, decent work and clean water are not just engineering or financial challenges. They're deeply rooted in social and political inequalities and whilst it's tempting to put problems like these into the too hard pile, FastLab knows that apathy won't move us towards that preferred state. In this instance we've come up with a new plan for the water filtration project. We'll reposition the product and increase our focus on developing that social licence. We'll rethink the original salesy based approach and instead develop partnerships with communities who need access to clean water, working with charities who are already doing this. A reimagining of the current business model will support community co-creation of the product using a mix of locally sourced open source hardware alongside the company's proprietary hardware, enabling communities to do it themselves, guided by company experts which in turn provides company employees with a renewed sense of purpose. They're actively helping some of the 770 million people who don't have access to clean water. And all this reconnects the business with its core skills and expertise as a solutions focused innovation company. We'll be posting progress on this initiative on the FastLab website, so do feel free to check in and see how we're doing. And of course, if you'd like to help, we'd love to hear from you. Has our mindset taken on a more ethical, critical ethos? Change and innovation is by its very nature complex and uncertain. Our future is unknown, so alongside the ability to use the tools at our disposal, there's a deep need for those bringing about change to be able to reflect, learn and continually develop their skills and personal resolve to implement systemic change. They need to cultivate personal resilience to prepare them for pushback and potential opposition. They need to be able to act with integrity and a strong sense of purpose. This requires skills in empathy, being able to translate across sectors, cultures and perspectives, building relationships and devising and facilitating activities to support the change process. At FastLab, we understand the need to include communities, stakeholders and wider audiences in change, using creative communication skills to engage and influence them in the process. The Clyde Street Precinct offers a grounded example of how we're helping to make this happen locally by adopting a bottom-up approach to the development of a creative ecosystem within which artists maintain a thriving, sustainable practice and citizens are included as co-creators of community facilities and livable city landscapes. 
I don't intend to go into many details about this project here as I'm delighted that we've been joined by all our stakeholders to give Clyde Street its own slot in this conference, so do check that out. The Clyde Street precinct is a large industrial warehouse complex close to FastLab and the University City and Callaghan campuses. Uh, the previously abandoned site now accommodates 65 artists and creative practitioners drawn from across the broad range of creative industries, jewellery, fashion, design, music recording and production, fabrication, multimedia, performing and visual arts, illustration, bookbinding, even stone masonry, film technology and experimental and electronic art. The organic development of this ecosystem, with artists working alongside waste, rescue, not-for-profit organisations, car hire businesses, has ensured an innovative and sustainable example of a creative economy. Since my earliest days here in Newcastle, it was clear that a step change in the way higher education supports its graduate artists to ensure they're adaptable, resilient and adequately prepared to build their creative practice was long overdue. Changes to funding also meant that the economics of delivering creative arts courses, which are made up of practice-led teaching and studio-based learning, became virtually untenable within university structures and business models. Our response was to develop a distributed model of delivery using a university, industry and community partnership. The inclusion and integration of private enterprise with some of the Clyde Street precinct operations functions not only to provide an alternative economic support in lieu of any government funding, but it also creates a space where local industry can engage the services of artists, designers and creators, benefiting both parties. These opportunities for collaboration can extend to students embedded within the Clyde Street precinct by completing the latter stages of their education within a distributed model of arts education that's embodied there. Rather than the centralised model previously employed here at the university, students can take up opportunities to make connections with local industry and private enterprise, generate paid employment, commissions and other benefits from their connections, advancing their education in new and valuable ways. One point I'd really like to make when developing partnerships is that working ethically insists on sensitivity to power and substantive community engagement. There's a lot of listening and continual monitoring for unintended and intended effects of the engagement and a requirement for flexibility to make adjustments and iterate as relationships develop, circumstances change and shared agendas or not emerge. Are we having fun yet? I'd like to think that playfulness is in Fast Lab's DNA. The work might be serious and at times genuinely difficult, but we have to enjoy ourselves doing it, and we do. Again, you'll possibly chance across some of the great work of our team elsewhere in the conference programme, but I'd just like to finish up with a brief visual montage of some of the projects we've been delighted to create from our very own imaginations, despite the pandemic. Work ranges from soundscapes to art exhibitions, interactive installations, video project projections, extended reality and VR, to computer games, from festivals, shows, to conferences and workshops, from complex multi-dimensional multi projects to small consultancies, with large and well-resourced organisations and companies and community groups that are much, much smaller in scale. So back to the beginning and the barometer of Garland's first things first, to ask if we're doing the good stuff that's worth investing our times, talent and energy in. To constantly remind ourselves to check whether we're making a positive difference. To see if we're still thinking critically and behaving ethically. And to look at whether we've left space to make sure we're having fun. And finally, to ask ourselves if we're not what's stopping us. Thanks for listening. All right, um, so I'm just going to change the view here so that we can see everyone. Uh, thanks for that uh, great presentation, Paul. Uh, we do have one question in the chat. Mary, would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Yeah, hello, Paul. Yes, thank you for um, 
Uh, am I, can you hear me? I think. I can, I think yes, I thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you for, you know, like bittersweet, I'll have to say, presentation, because everything you say is recognisable uh, and hopeful at the same time, recognisable in its kind of uh, horror and recognisable also in, in, in what's possible. So I have a, a, a thorny thing to ask you, because you talked about mindsets. And I think mindsets are really the key to so much at the moment, but they seem to be kind of in cement at the moment, at least in America, where I live at the moment, and no doubt in Australia too, from the news that I get. So I was gonna ask you, is this sort of a hierarchy of mindsets and is there different strategies that you might use for more malleable mindsets? You know, what, what, what and when, because, you know, around the environmental thing, how long have we been talking? How many facts are out there, you know? Or the health issue, or the political issues, you know, divided you fall, united you stand. I like all of those issues. It's sort of, um, you know, so that's why I think, is there a hierarchy? Are there different kind of mindsets that you might shift? Should you try on the little ones first before you try the big ones? Uh, do you have any kind of response to that thorny kind of question? It's a brilliant look at it. Fabulous question, Mary, and because we, we are absolutely, you know, universally grappling with the same stuff uh, wherever we are in the world. Um, and I guess, um, look, I guess it's, it, I, I'm probably not going to give you an adequate answer to that question, not surprisingly, because it's probably takes somebody much smarter than me to do that. But it's all for us just around, well, OK, um, there's that big stuff out there that we know. But what what small things can we do with those like minded people? to demonstrate um, those alternatives. And I know there's nothing new in that, and Ken Garland was pointing that out back in the 1960s, as we've said, uh, and it is surprising, isn't it, to go back yeah. to that manifesto and say, gosh, you know, have we actually changed at all? You know, we are still all, um, it, to some degree, beating ourselves up a, a little bit as practitioners, uh, but equally trying to work out um, who we can work with, who our allies are, um, how we can, uh, how we can bring about um, lasting change that's uh, that's transformative through channels that are probably now, if we're thinking about you know impact and policy, um, or changing the way perhaps that one of my examples that journalism um, um, operates that that they're part of a, a of a system that we already begin to recognise has failed us almost universally. So trying to work out how we build those new systems, if I can call them that. Uh, with those um, allies and those like-minded people seems to be the, it's a, it's the kind of tyranny of hope again, in, to some degree, isn't it? Because it seems to be the only way that we'll be able to take this debate on and take it forward by showing people rather than demonstrating, I think, or rather than telling, doing, you know? Now, Paul, when, when you and I were younger, we used to talk about the need to have social movements from the ground that change things. And now we're kind of retreating, and I feel guilty about this, retreating into our bubbles, not only just because of COVID, but retreating into like-minded kind of smaller communities to survive, to endure, to kind of block out the things we feel that we can't shift. So I just think strategically, I'm not sure about the uh, kind of robustness of the let's stay small and within our our circle of interest because I think it's a kind of a, a different kind of retreat and that's what the system wants. These systems that we're up against want us to retreat in that way. Yeah, I think it's look. I think there's a again you bang on. It's it's a danger, isn't it? And yet at the same time we um, we. I think, I think authenticity is, is a real key here, isn't it? And developing what we're trying to do, uh, I guess, here, and, and it is small scale, and I don't know the answers to this, but, but with things like the Clyde Street project, um, you know, there's a, there is genuinely, you know, four or five years work of, of working with uh, community and kind of for community to grow that almost kind of incrementally, inch by inch, in the hope that it becomes eventually, um, let's call it, you know, I don't mean dominant majority, but the large majority. Um, it's, of course, not there um, yet, but um, but I, I don't really know any, I don't think that as an academic here and even as a full professor, I've not got really much, many other levers to pull 
I'm, I'm not convinced that just um, endlessly imagining that we're going to write papers that impact policy changes very much at all because policies as we well as we well know policies are selected by governments to suit their own political ideologies not necessarily and because of the moment that to win elections not necessarily because they're uh, the right thing to do and gosh if corona and covid have taught us anything it's absolutely that all right thank you paul and kudos for the work that you guys do. It's very impressive. Thank you very much, Mary. It's really nice to hear from you. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from Jared. Jared, would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Sure. Hi, Paul. Hi, Jared. I, I was really interested to hear what you were saying about FastLab working with the media companies and journalists. Uh, and the reason why is because I worked I worked for multiple media companies throughout 2017 to 2019 in different states of Australia, and I could sense the desperation uh, there to like prove and maintain their worth and relevance, which you sort of pointed to that the media, they need to maintain their relevance. Uh, and I was just wondering how they've been responding so far, if you've started working with them to change the way they do things. Has, I'm just wondering if there's been any resistance um, because it's been said that there's this Murdoch monopoly in Australia and, and the nine Fairfax mergers apparently spelt the death of investigative journalism. That's, that's what we've been told in many circles. So, and like, I guess a lot of journalists within that would be uh, prefer to maintain the status quo and go about their business of sensationalism and, and keeping people um, hooked. So, do you have any preliminary reactions or results from working with media companies on that sort of thing? Uh, yeah, well, oh, most of my work, um, Jared, has been done kind of in that international um, sphere, which is one of the reasons, I guess, the guys from the Global Alliance said, you know, um, what are you doing in your lab to impact and affect what's happening in um, Australia? And, and again, you know, to my um, embarrassment at the time, I said, well, look, you know, we, we do all this great stuff. We've got lots of... Um, ideas about how to bring about change and co-facilitate change and, and, and work and, and enough experience, I suppose, and expertise from working in, uh, you know, in Europe and in the Americas, et cetera, and in, in sort of the previous roles to be able to bring that and unpack it um, in, uh, in Australia. But as you pointed out, I, Australia was at a very different place when I arrived in Australia. In fact, I'd almost have said, it was surprising to me to find, for example, that um, and a, in a good way, I mean, a really positive way, uh, that many of the things that I'd imagined could have been happening um, would have been uh, like the meltdown of media operations in Europe and across the Americas, uh, the closure of regional uh, publications, etc. That kind of hadn't happened when I stepped off the plane in 2017. It didn't take much longer than that. I was only here for a matter of months before TV stations were closing, before the Fairfax merger, before many of the things that you've described, and beginning to recognise that even in our old city, in Newcastle, um, talking with the news editor there, where a newsroom had once upon a time had perhaps 70 staff now had, I think it was the time I was talking to them, around about you know, 15 or 20. Um, that decimation was just beginning to I think that the news industry in Australia, from the conversations that we've been having, they're still reeling from that. I think that they're still uh, reticent. I think you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a, a mindset, um, again, um, that there are definitely individuals who, quite rightly, because they've got particular skill sets, they would prefer things to stay just as they were. But we know, and your experience has doubtless told you, that that isn't going to be viable um, or tenable in the future. Uh, but rather than just trying to sustain the old practice, actually give journalism a new mission to work with us as society towards transforming um, society. And I know it sounds kind of um, highfalutin, and I know, um, you know, um, uh, shareholders and all the rest of it that are, in, that are involved in many of these organisations are less interested in changing the world than getting their dividend. Um, but I absolutely honestly think that that's the only way that we'll Journalism's got to be about us connecting with our audiences, with our readership, with our viewers, um, and actually um, creating the type of, of content that they genuinely care about in a planet that is absolutely under threat would give us that new sense of purpose. So to honestly answer your question, um, no, we've made very little headway here in Australia, not because uh, we've been feckless particularly, but because the landscape is still 
you know, back in back in Britain and in Europe, as you'll know from your studies, um, and, and over in the States, that had all been happening. It was almost like a welcome relief to arrive in Australia to find that there were media policies that were still protecting regional production. Um, now that they've disappeared, of course, it's that eerie, uh, you, I can see what's coming next. And that's one of the reasons that I agreed to write the op-ed piece and want to connect with the Global Alliance of Media Innovation and bring some of their practice uh, over here to see if we can, um, I don't say help, that sounds patronising, but engage, get involved and, uh, and work with news organisations because it's fundamental. Um, to democracy, as we well know. I don't think that answers your question adequately, um, Jared. I'm aware of that, but um, no, no, but it, it's, best um, answer I've got. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate it. No, it's it's a great answer. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Bill. Bill, would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Yes. Yeah. Neil, thanks for that. Um, that great talk. <laughs> inspiring. Um, you know, I, I laugh when I say inspiring because. I wish, uh, I wish that we're, the world were kind of like that in a way. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, one of my worries, though, is the reality of the world is that, uh, and particularly the world of design, it's a world of businesses that need to make profits, um, where profits are more important than, um, and also, you know, they need to be sustainable as well, and they have to account for their 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 work in a financial year. Um, which is a lot shorter than the, um, the framework that we're dealing with with climate change. So the logic of our systems is such that what you're saying is aspirational, but hard to do, you know what I mean? So um, the question is to what extent you feel in the design area, um, a kind of set of permanent resistances, you know what I mean? To the extent, now, you know, if you're dealing with say a community that's dealing with the water issue, that's a public issue, it's a community issue. It might, in the Australian context, be an Indigenous community. So there's a different set of logic. But most, a lot of businesses, um, through no fault of their own, um, a lot of the time, are operating on different time frames and different logics. Um, and it's not a matter of just trying to persuade them to be better people, <laughs> because you know, um, it's the it's a set of systemic time frames, and you must feel that you must feel that acutely in the design area, particularly. Um, yeah. That was just a, a, that's a kind of a comment which is implied. No, it's <laughs> really good, Bill. I think it's great, Bill. I, you, you, again, it's sort of it does. There's a there's a sort of and it's deliberately kind of um, I hope hope a reasonably you know aesthetically attractive naivety in most of what I've been able to present today. It's an, it's an idealism and an ideology that was rooted in, you know, um, almost like the kind of the 60s sort of um, uh, hippie movement that's that on one level seems kind of completely out of place with, a, uh, you know, um, the, the system that is capitalism, um, basically, and, and, and companies that have got to exist. Those journalism organisations I was just uh, referring to are, are in exactly the same position you know they their shareholders demand or were demanding in the UK still you know a 25 percent return on their dividends annually they were expecting audiences for print to to rise constantly uh, despite the fact that, uh, that that the whole industry was moving in a very very different direction so refocusing and repurposing is that um thing that I think that 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 um it would be my kind of mantra and, and call for them for design agencies uh, specifically and for design um, specifically. Yeah, I I think that there's so much scope still to do many of the things and, and to to do many of the things that, that I've I guess hinted at um, there in the uh, or, or, or superficially kind of skated across in that presentation. Um, but still that recognition that we we actually do live in a, a, a of course we live in a capitalist system and um, we benefit from um, that capitalist system uh, but there's uh, degrees of that isn't there in terms of um, how far we we might want to go and even down to that personal ethic of you know what sort of clients would we prepared would we be prepared to take over i, I was very kind of um, impressed actually uh, and, and intrigued uh, after hearing a professorial talk by Alan Mayo, who's here at the conference, uh, asynchronously at least, he came over to Newcastle and did a professorial talk about um, being paid a very, very large sum of, uh, of money by um, a chemical company it was who'd developed a chemical to destroy a particular bug. 
uh, and he created this fabulous drawing illustration of this killer bug that was destroying crops and so on and so forth. Um, was paid from, by all accounts, uh, you know, uh, what we would call in the UK, a shed load of cash to do it. And then found out um, some months after uh, the, um, uh, the, the chemical was released and crops were being sprayed, that this particular killer bug that they'd identified was abs absolutely essential within the, the ecosystem, the environmental system for preserving it, because it actually fed on other um, you know, kind of predatory bugs uh, that were also damaging the crops. I tell you that story partly because, you know, Alan would say, you know, if I was offered that brief and if I'd known that before I started, then of course I probably wouldn't have taken the brief. But at the same time, um, it's a complicated, uh, complex system. I guess if we're not asking those questions, which I suppose is where um, Garland comes in and just says, apply that, switch your brain on before you start doing this. Are we doing good? At least don't do harm. I guess that's what I would, that's what I would offer. Um, if, if we could just squeeze in one more question, I'm going to read Gloria's question uh, quickly. Um, it, it, thank you for your insightful presentation, Paul. Um, it touches on so many aspects that are so relevant right now, which bring which are bringing bringing societal and personal anxieties into many shapes and forms. What are your thoughts on activating the role of designer in a manner which invites businesses, small and large, nonprofits, and and large ones, uh, uh, which are both small and large, as well as communities and individuals to become designers of their own individual communal and societal wants and needs. I feel designers' roles are moving into a more strategic and overarching activities, which help lead industry, business, and community endeavors, doing the designs of their own, of their own. We designers still create, develop artifacts, but I feel like the direction is moving to enabling communities to make their own designs. Yeah, that's a really nice, that's a great comment. It's a really nice way to finish out here because um, um, I think I think that, that, that now thinking about us as educators here in the academy, um, uh, working with our students, um, probably what we can best do uh, is um, encourage them and support them in being able to, to do exactly what you've just described so that they absolutely can um, get involved in uh, supporting uh, communities to, to, to DIY. Um, the thing is about design, the beautiful thing about design is designers, um, like lots of creative and talented people, we've got a whole bunch of skill sets that I know we all tend to hugely undervalue you know when when I used to be a, years ago I used to be a professional musician and I thought nothing of it I could rock up and play and do all of those kind of bits and pieces and it was only after actually after joining the academy when I met so many friends who couldn't even play the the, the banjo four notes on a banjo um uh, that they started to really kind of admire the fact that you've got the and then you started to think but we've got a whole bunch of other skills as well and what design is great at, and I don't want this to sound wrong, but I think it might, um, but, but quite often we don't, we need somebody else to bring the content to help us shape or all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think uh, working with communities and using all the skills that we've got to facilitate, uh, develop uh, and support uh, those communities is a really, that will be a, a new form of design. Just in the same way that, you know, we moved through, you know, graphic design and we now focus on, service design i guess it's a similar thing but perhaps at a more uh, community-based level and i guess what you've touched on is what we've been trying to do i suppose with with clyde street you know without getting in the way but working out how can we support and use what skills and facilities and resources that we've got access to um uh, to, to to help and encourage and support them to do it themselves 